Akero has Nashua, the Derby winner on the rail in this $100,000 match race for championship of 1955. Willie Schumacher with Swaps. Now, two lengths behind. Is Swaps done? Has Willie shot the boat with the big red coat from California? No, here he comes again. The patient Willie's been biding his time. He's moving in. They're closing together. Who's going to take it? Swaps or Nashua? Winner take all. The 1955 Thoroughbred Racing Championship. Swaps versus Nashua is the theme of our show on The Way It Was. Kurt Gowdy. Welcome to our series of American Sports Classics. This week, the Sport of Kings Thoroughbred Racing. And to help us relive these unforgettable racing moments, we're proud to have two immortals. The pilot of Nashua, the only jockey to ever win two triple crowns, Eddie Arcaro. And Swaps' jockey, he was only 23 years old in 1955, but was considered the greatest young rider in racing. Two years earlier, he set an all-time record for wins in one year, 485. We're talking about Willie Shoemaker. And to help us recreate the 55 Triple Crown, take us down the paths of glory, one of the finest broadcasters of sports who has broadcast horse racing for more years, I think, that he wants to uh, remember, Wynn Elliott. Wynn, you've seen a lot of great horses over the years. How would you rate these two? Well, they certainly have to cut among the best with Citation and the likes of Kelso and Secretariat. These are truly what we call classic horses. Well, how about setting the scene now? Let's start back. And we well, start back with the Kentucky Derby. No, when you start back, you start back in the two-year-old year where Nashua and Summer Tan had been it. And then Summer Tan got ill, dangerously ill, almost died, but they recovered. And Cheryl Ward, his trainer, brought him around and so it was Nashua and Summer Tam coming into the Derby. Out on the coast, where Eastern horsemen didn't pay much attention in those days, was a thing called swaps. He won the Santa Anita Derby. That got people a little excited. But as they came together in Louisville, it was Nashua, Summer Tam, and that thing from California. So now let's go back to Churchill Downs, Kentucky. It's May 7th. By the way, it's the birthday of our announcer, Win Elliott, but it's 1955. Hello, sports fans. It's May 7th, Louisville, Kentucky, and we're approaching post time for the Run for the Roses, the 81st time, the Kentucky Derby at Churchill Downs. Over 100,000 race fans have shown up to wager on who is going to take this biggest of all three-year-old races, the richest derby ever, 125,000. Of course, everybody wants to come to the race, and many of the famous make it. There's Arthur Godfrey. He thinks that William Woodward Jr.'s Nashua, the favorite, is going to be the first in citation to win the Triple Crown. Oh, Irene done. She is a Californian. She likes Rex Ellsworth's California bread. Swaps. That's her fave. Bob Hope. He saw Summer Tan and Nashua race. He thinks Nashua is going to maintain his edge. As you can see, it's overcast, dark, and gloomy here in Louisville. That's where he got the cold. But the track on this mile and a quarter race is fast. There are going to be 10 of them try for the Derby. It's the smallest field since 48 when Cole Town and Citation topped a field of six. Blue Lamb, Racing Fool, Flying Fury, Nabezna, Honey's Alibi, Nashua, Trim Destiny, Swaps, Jeans, Joe, and Summer Tan as the field. But most people think the race is going to be right here. That is number five, William Woodward's Nashua with Eddie Acaro. There's Willie Schumacher, Mish Tenney, and Swaps, the California horse. The starter's got them all lined up. He presses the button, and here comes history. They're off. And in the middle of the track, that's Nashua and Trim Destiny breaking smartly. Eddie Arcaro's got his kid right out there, but now he decides to take him back. And moving to the forefront is the horse from California with Willie Schumacher in the darker of the silks. That is Swaps making his move. Number seven, as they come by the stands the first time, it's the fleet Khaled Colt who's got the measure of Trim Destiny on the inside. He gets ahead in front, and now free striding, but under command. And there goes Swaps around the first time with Trim Destiny, Nashua, and 
Summer Tan in that order. A Carol. Oh, there's Brian Field who was watching the race. And the folks, too. As everybody comes to his feet, as William Swaps has the lead on the inside in the darker of the silks. Look at Eddie Carroll on Nashua pumping, urging and pushing. And now he goes to the whip, trying to catch the California Colt. But this looks like it's going to be Swaps and Willie Shoemaker's day. He begins to lengthen his stride. He's pulling away. And over 100,000 have realized this is the second time in Churchill Downs history a Californian wins the race. It swaps Nashua, followed by Summer Tan. And that's it, the Churchill Downs Kentucky Derby. And there he is, 23-year-old Willie Schumacher, his first derby win ever. The derby winner of 1955, Swaps. You're watching Classic Sports Network. Now, back to The Way It Was on Classic Sports Network. Willie Shoemaker, you've had just about every thrill that could ever happen to a jockey. What was your feeling when you flashed across that wire with your first derby victory? I really couldn't believe it at the time. Uh, it was a great thrill for me. It was my first derby win, and uh, I'd ridden maybe three or four of them, but I really got a big thrill out of that because Nashua and Summertime were the big horses from the east, and we were from the west. Eddie, that was the first defeat of the year for your horse, Nashua. He was a speed horse. Did you expect Swaps to set such a blistering pace? Well, um, Nashua really wasn't a speed horse. He was any kind of horse. He was truly a great, a great horse, but both of them were. What, what I did do, I really uh, underestimated Swaps. I was never that far off of Swaps. I just thought I could go get him and run by him any time I wanted to. Mm -hmm. Of course I didn't. Willie, what was your racing plan, you and your trainer, Mesh Tenney? Actually, he told me to take him back and lay second or third with him if I could because uh, he kind of liked to look around a lot when he got in front by himself. Uh, but I didn't, I had so much hold of him, I had to let him go to the lead and everybody else was taken back at the same time. So I just let him go on the lead and then he relaxed. That's what I was going to ask you. Did you, were you running a control pace insofar as a fast horse, if he's running within himself, is going to have plenty left when he gets to the stretch? And then no matter how good Eddie and his horse were, you still would have yes, enough. I had an easy lead all the way. And uh, when Eddie came to me, my horse was looking around. I'd never really ask him to run. What about the leather sole that uh, Swaps wore on one of his forehooves? He had a, he had an infection in his foot, but, and he had a leather uh, sole underneath the shoe. But he ran all right on it in, in the, on a fast track. I think one day in the mud, they worked him and some mud had gotten up under there and it had a, affected him somewhat. But. Well, you've ridden a lot of horses since. How would you rate Swaps? Then I want to ask Eddie about Nashville. How would you rate Swaps as one well, of the horses Well, I think he was ridden? a great horse. He was probably as good a horse as I ever rode in my life. Mm -hmm. And how about Nashua, Eddie? You rode, what, a whirl away in Citation? Well, I think Citation might drown him, and so would uh, Kelso. <laughs> uh, but not, uh, not ability-wise, by the way. Nashua had as much ability as any horse that ever lived. But he didn't have the, uh, the will that the other two horses that I mentioned had. They would just give all out to win. And Nashua had uh, a, a little of the Naz rule of blood, as we call it in racing, yeah. which was a little temper battle. Mm -hmm. And he really didn't give every day. Where the other two horses that I just mentioned, Citation gave everything every day, and so would Kelso. You know, I was Nashua's biggest knocker. And Mr. Fitzsimmons says, said to me one day, he says, I can't understand how you can keep knocking this horse. All, all he does is win. I said, but, but he's the type of a horse that would beat, uh, win by a neck or a half a length or whatever in some of his races. And you knew that if he would really give, he could run much faster. Blow so away he, with it. Yeah. What has impressed me in our Caro description of a great horse was a horse who moves, which moves so easily that you're not aware how fast he's going because everything is going like a beautiful watch as of a piece. When he would work citation in the morning, it would be difficult to anticipate what the fractions were. You'd have to really guess. Am I quoting you correctly? I think Ed? any good horse is really horse hard is to rhythm. judge time. Yeah, great rhythm. I think a time. good story about time. that is the time you went to Chicago and worked Nashua in five-eighths of a mile, wasn't it? Or, yeah, I worked in five-eighths of a mile in 55 seconds, which is, you know, just that wins. unheard of. Mm -hmm. And when I came back off him, Mr. Fitz says, how much faster could he win? I said, oh, I guess three or four seconds. <laughs> <laughs> so I, you know, I was so far out of line. Yeah, was, uh... yeah. Why didn't Rex Ellsworth, the owner of Swaps, enter the horse in the Triple Derby? He had, I think, until February 15th to 
to make the nomination and pay a $250 fee. Did you ever get the story? You mean a Triple Crown? In the yeah. Triple Pringles Crown. In the Belmont? I don't, I don't know. I think that one of the reasons is that he was a California guy, and Hollywood Park had gotten him to bring the horse back and run him in a few races out here. Uh, you know, like the Hollywood Derby and, this, and the uh, Gold Cup and whatever. But he, uh, I was disappointed he didn't run him in the Preakness and the Belmont. We'll return in just a moment to The Way It Was on Classic Sports Network. Swaps goes back to California. In the meantime, Nashua keeps going in the Triple Crown. And let's go now to Maryland's Pimlico and then to New York's Belmont Park for the second and third jewels of the Triple Crown. And here's Harry Wismer and Wynn Elliott to describe it to us. So Pimlico down in Baltimore and more than 26,000 rally round for the second gem and racing triple crown, the Preakness. Eight three-year-olds parade out for the race and the odds-on favorite is Nashua. Belair Studs fine Colt. They're in the gate. And they're off for the mile and three sixteenth trip. Coming past the stand, Saratoga, ridden by Nick Shuck, takes the lead. Honey Dalabai is second. Fleet past third, and Nashua, with Eddie Arcaro in the saddle, is fourth. Swap, winner of the Kentucky Derby, is not entered. Going down the back stretch, still in the same order. Saratoga, Honey Dalabai, Fleet Path, and Nashua. But now, Nashua is starting to move. He rolls past Fleet Path and Honey's Alibi, and they drop back. Coming around the turn, Saratoga is still holding on to the lead by half a length. He gave Nashua a real battle in the Florida Derby, and he's giving the Belair Colt another one in this freakness. Out of the turn, into the stretch. That's Saratoga on the inside, with Nashua trying to pass him. Dueling down the stretch, Saratoga gives ground grudgingly, but Nashua gains inch by inch and hits the wire winner by a length. For Nashua, a big one, and a first over $67,000. And so here we are in the middle of June, Wynn Elliott back with you again to Old Belmont for the third and most testing leg of the Triple Crown, the mile and a half Belmont Stakes. They like to call it the test of champions. And there's the horse everybody thinks is going to be the champion on this dull, rainy day. And he gets out of the gate smartly as usual, Eddie Arcaro and William Woodward's Nashua. That's he, number six with the Bel Air colors. Eddie takes a quick look over his shoulder on the left to see what the rest of the field is going to do. He knows this is a mile and a half. He knows you can't really get shot out. That class has got to tell on a race this long. He's taken him back a little. That's he on the outside. He's now rounding the field. If you can spot the white with the dots. Eddie Arcaro on Nashua. He's got his eyes on the top. And here's a fella's got his eyes on the winner's window. And it's going to be Nashua. Look at him. Stretch it out. He's got a six-length lead now. Eddie checks the rest of the field as he pulls away seven lengths, eight lengths, and just about nine lengths as William Woodward's Nashua with Eddie Arcaro goes over the Belmont finish line, the winner. Nashua, Blazing Cup, Portersville, Jabna, Flying Fury, Mr. L.L., and Rata Merrow of the King Ranch. And there it is, Eddie Arcaro and Nashua, the Belmont winners of 1955. Well, two outstanding wins for you, Eddie, the Preakness and Belmont. When you won the Preakness aboard Nashua, that was a new track record. The surprise horse was Saratoga. We'd like to replay that race and have you take us along and tell it the way it was as Saratoga pushed Nashua. So let's go back now to the Preakness, that year of the Triple Crown. Well, he uh, ran up uh, Saratoga, by the way, wasn't all that great a horse. And this is what I was trying, trying to explain to you a little while ago, that if you, if you see Nashua right now, he has his ears pinned right back on his neck and he was going to win, all right, but he really should have beat a horse like that further than he did had he been, been the type of a horse that would go on, which he, which he wasn't. You won, but were you disappointed in Nashua that day? Well, you never disappointed collecting $67,000. No. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, he always 
<laughs> he never gave you the confidence that he was going to give all. That's what I was. Uh, that's what I'm trying to say. Two days after Nashua won the Preakness, you were aboard Swaps in the Will Rogers Stakes at uh, Hollywood Park. But you must have had a strong feeling inside you, Willie Shoemaker, that you weren't back there running Swaps in the Preakness in the second leg of the Triple Crown. Well, as I said before, I was disappointed he didn't run the horse in these two races. But I might have been more disappointed had he run him. He might have beaten him, you know. So. Who knows what would have And on that very day that uh, Nashua won at Belmont by nine lanes, roaring away with Eddie aboard, uh, Swaps broke the world record at Hollywood Park. Uh, what was your thinking then? Well, uh, the two, the two different kind of racetracks, actually. In Belmont Park's a sandy, deep track, and Hollywood was a fast track. So the time, you could not compare the times at different tracks because of their condition. You're watching Back to the Way It Was on Classics. Here we are now. Our Carroll's won at the Preakness and Belmont after losing the Derby to Swaps. Yeah. Swaps has come back west, mm -hmm. running great, setting world records, and now the talk starts. Yes, Let's have the match race. Swaps against Nashua. Mm -hmm. They say one man was a catalyst for this match race. The movie uh, star, was Don Amici. Who invented Don Amici? the telephone and various other little And he invented amenities. the match race. Yes, well, <laughs> he was in Chicago at the time and Ben Lindheimer was alive. And, and as I said, a match race happens because you have the horses, you have the time, you have the place, and there's the money. It was the East against the West, as you remember, fellows. It was Fitzsimmons' classical training methods against the cowboy methods of Ellsworth and Tenney. It was the master against the newcomer, whom the master had already said was the greatest he's seen coming on. Everything came to fruition to bring the excitement to a fever pitch for that afternoon in Chicago. And so we're going to Chicago's Washington Park. August 31st, 1955, for what they called the race of the century. And here to describe it to you is Win Elliott. Here it is the fall of the year, actually August, and the big question in racing circles is, which is the better of the two three-year-old heroic horses? Is it this one? Nashua with Al Robertson leading him off the train. This is the Eastern candidate for championship honors. He had won the Preakness and the Belmont. Or was it that brilliant red coat from California, Sonny Jim Fitzsimmons? Boy, what a trainer and what a nice guy. Always smiling, just as affable as he looks. Here's the red guy from California with Chester White, one of the stable boys on swaps. The second horse to ever win the Derby from California. Look at that beautiful stride. He's power personified, but so is Nashua. So, what about, well, here's the Ellsworth family, and what a lovely morning to be out and watching a, a horse like this that comes along just once in a lifetime. The Midwest is, what, all agog as they are preparing for the match race of the century, and they come scooting into Washington Park to see which of these two horses is going to do it. Not only is it East versus West, but it's the traditional training methods of Jim Fitzsimmons versus the cowboy approach to the racehorse Rex Ellsworth and Mish Tenney. Everybody who could get there was there. The day, nice and warm, and for the first time, the two horses, just to give everybody a chance to see them saddle, they're saddled in the infield, right out in front, swaps the big red guy, and then Nashua with his entourage. You can see that this happens to be swaps that's Rex Ellsworth in the dark suit just turning to his left now and here's Eddie Arcaro couldn't be a better jockey than old banana nose and on one of his favorite Masrula Colts he's got a lot to prove here today and there's Willie Shoemaker the little toy watch charm jockey coming on with the cowboy horse swaps and now the big field tenses as everybody comes down to the inside rail as we approach a starting gate with a once-in-a-lifetime sight, just two horses in there. Arcaro and Nashua on the inside, and the bell rings, and they're out of the gate, and look at Nashua, look at Eddie whip in that Belair stud horse to get him out front. Willie takes a look over his left, and they seem to be even as they come down the grandstand way at the first turn, but there is Nashua in full stride. He's got the lead now, a full length as they make that first turn. We understand the track is a little drier and faster on the inside, and that's where the old master Eddie has taken his horse. But Willie's got lots of big red cold under him. Look at him start to come up now with those gorgeous little wrists of his. He's inching, swaps up. Now it's a half length. He's almost got him up to the head. 
But Eddie is not going to have any of that. Can Nashua hold him off? He's stretching out a little. Look at Eddie going to the pump as they go up the back stretch. And it's Nashua now lengthening out a half length, three quarters, and it's just about a full length lead now. As Belair studs Nashua with Eddie Arcaro sticking under the dry side of the track, has got two lengths of a lead on swaps now, maybe two and a half. But Willie isn't done. Here he comes again. The big red coat from California is inching up. Gee, and he pulled away again. It says cat and mouse. As Sonny Jim Fitzsimmons has got this Nashua cold in the greatest shape of his life. He's got a two-length lead again. Eddie seems to be opening up. His swap's done. Has Willie shot the boat? No, here they come again. Three-eighths of a mile coming up. They're that close to home. Look at Willie drawing closer, closer, stride by stride. But Nashua seems to have enough. There goes Willie to the whip, left-handed. Eddie answers with the whip, both hands now. They're coming into the stretch. It looks like Nashua is, or Swaps begins to falter a little here, and now it looks like Eddie and Nashua have the day. Eddie and Nashua, four lengths in the lead and pulling away. Eddie looked over his shoulders, couldn't find the California Colt. He doesn't care now. He's gonna keep Nashua about his business as he heads to the finish line, Washington Park. He's gonna do it. Eddie Arcaro and Nashua, they beat Swaps in the match race of the century. East beats West. Eddie Arcaro takes the measure of Willie Shoemaker. And for this year, 1955, horse on this day, horse of the year, the Bel Air Studs, Nashua. We'll return in just a moment to The Way It Was on Classic Sports Network. We've had a lot of famous athletes in this show. Baseball, football, all kinds of sports. And the remarkable thing to me when as these two gentlemen have sat here, Willie Shoemaker and Eddie R. Carroll, I looked at their faces as this race was run, and I can see them going back in time, back to those very moments in 1955. Eddie, how'd you feel when you flashed across the, the finish line, the winner? I felt pretty good. I was uh, I naturally built up for the race. But I think, uh, I think anybody would have felt good. It's, uh, you know, it's the build up, and you've got the adrenaline going, and, and uh, they had built it up east against west, and, or swaps having a decision against Nashua. It was a thing, really, it, uh, quite a thing. I'll swear, yeah. when those starting gates broke, that I heard a scream. They said you let out a scream and, and hit Nashua to come out of there. You wanted to, to get in a certain position in the track, did you? Well, uh, number one, I think going into the race, I was lucky enough uh, to have draw the best post position. Uh, it had rained, and that track, although it looked fast in the movies, it wasn't. It was a very deep track, and uh, there was a path that was kind of where my stall was, and Bill had a lot the worst of it where he was. We both had the same idea, to try to get the lead and just go as far as you can, as fast as you can, and that's mm -hmm. what it's all about. You knock each other out as fast as you can do it. Mm -hmm. What was your feeling when the race was over, Willie? Well, I knew that, uh, that the best horse and the best rider won that race that day. He, uh, this... Old master here gave me a hell of a riding lesson that day, I must say that. Yeah. Yeah. You were the greatest of friends, fellas. How did that come into this race? Well, well that's, no, I mean, you're out there to try to win. He was the same as I was. Uh, but I must say that I was surprised. I knew about what he was going to do, you know, in the beginning. But he left that gate whipping and slashing and hollering. He's, he almost scared the hell out of me. <laughs> <laughs> were you surprised when uh, Swap's always broke and went out in yeah. front? <laughs> well, actually, Swap's didn't break that good. Uh, he kind of no, came out of the sideways a little bit. Right. Day, yeah. uh, I don't think he would have outrun him going in the first turn no matter what happened. Eddie, let's, let's watch this great horse back in action again as you win this famous match race with Swap's. And I think we're going to pick it up here in the back stretch. And you tell us the way it really was here. Well, as I said before, in a match race, you just run as fast as you've got to run. And try never to lose the lead. If you do, uh, you're really trying to find out which horse is really the best. And this is the only way I know how you test them. Just let them run as fast as they can and as far as they can. And of course, uh, these horses, by the way, ran through the first three quarters of a mile in nine and four se fifth seconds on one of the worst racetracks you've ever seen. It was a very deep, bad racetrack. Mm -hmm. And somebody had to give. It was just that, that simple. By the way, one part of this race, I was frightened. Uh, when I uh, 
It'll, it'll be down in the stretch, of course. And as I drew, when I drew away, swaps evidently. And he did come back after that race hurting, didn't he, Bill? Yes, he did. He must have, uh, something happened to him. And as you'll see here, when he dropped way back off of me and, and then ducked into the rail, I really thought Bill had fell. And you'll see me turn, raise up and yeah. almost turn around because it scared me. I couldn't find him. He's getting tired now. You see him swerve in behind you here and duck right there, see it? No, yep. he's had it. Well, there goes Nashua. They see me look around, I couldn't yeah. find him. Yeah. <laughs> Willie, the, 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 the deep track didn't hurt, I mean, didn't help that padded foot any, did it? Oh, it didn't help it, but I don't, as I say again, had it been a fast track or whatever it might have been, I don't think that that day he could have beaten Nash the way he ran. Eddie, by the end of 55, Nash would won a quarter of a million dollars. That was a record in those days. What happened to him after that? Well, as a four-year-old, he got very mean. This was his three-year-old year, and uh, in fact, in the middle of the summer, they retired him. And he got he mean? He'd get in the starting gate, yes, got very uh, studdish. He'd want to... Uh, like his old man. Horses. Right? Yes, yeah. the Naz rule to start coming yeah. out on him. Right, really. <laughs> and what happened to Swaps when he went back to the West Coast, Willie? Well, he won some races after that. He won the Gold Cup and he carried 130 pounds. Uh, in fact, one race I rode him later, I think in Chicago, the next year uh, against uh, Summer 10. Eddie happened to ride Summer 10 that day and he, I had 130 Swaps did and he had 115, I believe, or right. 16. And he ran by Summer 10 like he was tied to the fence that day. In that particular race, I was in front, and they ran the first three quarters of a mile in seven and four-fifths seconds, going a flat mile. And I, I thought I had a little hole in my horse, and I looked on the outside, and Shoemaker had Swaps bent double. <laughs> wow. <laughs> That's how fast that Swaps was really Didn't good he run that mile in 33 and something? 33 and 33. one or two, I think it was. Wasn't two that a record at that time? I think it was, yes. Yeah. But before we finish, since I've worked with these guys through the years and they, they aren't going to talk about themselves naturally, you're right when you say two of the greatest ever. And the guy on the left, Eddie, was strong, determined, motivated, intelligent. The other fellow there, his good younger friend, had, had maybe perhaps a little more finesse, a little gentler, thought his races, but like a champion in any sport, Kurt, as you found out, as you've talked to them through the years, you never get to be a champion unless you got a, a, a head up there. And both these guys could see races as patterns. They could see how the field would open and what to do, whereas other fellows would just see horses running. They didn't look, they saw. And these are two of one of a kind. They're real champs. You know something I've got? One of my weaknesses is I love to be around front runners and winners. And it's great to be with our Carol and Shoemaker. And so that's it. We want to thank Eddie R. Carroll, Willie Shoemaker, and Wynn Elliott. And so it was that Nashua was a better horse that day in Chicago, which was really the greatest. Believe me, the controversy still rages because the two champions would never race again against each other. However, one thing that will never be disputed is that Eddie R. Carroll and Willie Shoemaker are the greatest jockeys in thoroughbred racing history, and their names stand tall in racing's Hall of Fame. This is Kurt Gowdy saying, that's the way it was when Nashua beat Swaps in the race of the century. Tonight on ESPN Classic Sports, at 8, see the world of Jackie Stewart, Part 1. Followed at 8.30 by the Buddy Baker story on Victory Lane. Then at 9, enjoy Irish Night at the Fights on Friday Night at the Fights. Only on ESPN Classic Sports. Classic Sports Network, once-in-a-lifetime moments, 24 hours a day.